Want to achieve network marketing success? Then you're in the right company. Hello, and welcome to Leave Nothing to Chance, hosted by networking marketing giant, John Solider. Learn everything you need to know about the network marketing space from somebody who's actually done it. Join us every week for front row seats as we feature some of the finest and most successful personalities in network marketing. Leave nothing to chance. Join us now. Hey, my privilege today, my friends, to uh, introduce you. Uh, some of you know him. I, I've certainly I've heard his name for many years. Uh, Carl Becker has founded and run numerous companies uh, over the last 30 plus years and now runs Improving Sales Performance, a consultancy that supports sales organizations to build high performing teams and achieve their revenue goals. He's the author of Set Up to Win. Three Frameworks to a High-Performing Sales Organization and Sales and Marketing Alignment. He has a BA in Economics from Colorado College and an MBA from the University of Colorado in Boulder. So, uh, Carl, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for letting me be here. I love uh, the topics you always explore and how you interact with your guests. So thank you for letting me come and share. Well, my 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 privilege, and and uh, we're going to get into a lot of stuff today, sales wise, and maybe some non sales stuff. Who knows? Uh, we'll see how well the internet performs for us, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Carl, could could you tell us about the concept of iceberg selling and what inspired you to develop this approach? Yeah, I love the idea of iceberg selling, and really the 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 quick drill down takeaway comment is this: everyone's an iceberg. You're an iceberg. I'm an iceberg. If you're selling, the person you're selling to is an iceberg. And what I mean by that is we usually only see about 10% above the surface, just like an iceberg. Think about Titanic, the movie, right? Uh, and the more you can see underneath, the more you can be a service, the more you learn about somebody. So for me, you know, I love salespeople. I'm a salesperson. I've done that my entire career. And so what inspired me is like, how can I create a really fun book full of stories, easy to read, inspirational, but with a lesson and some best practices that we can all remember quickly. And like I said, Biggest one is everything's an iceberg. And the more you can look underneath the service, the more you can understand, the more you can understand, more possibilities happen. And if you're selling, most likely uh, really good things happen. You solve problems and uh, make some sales. Well, it, it, it just makes total sense, right? The, the, the more you know, the better service you can give and you know the, the more opportunities that exist both for you and, and your clients. So I lo lo love that concept. Uh, now, how does the lifetime value mindset change the way salespeople interact with their customers. Yeah. So I think a lot of us as salespeople, and I know I was this way early in my career, I really hung onto that bat too tight. It was like, I need to hit these goals. I need to hit this money. I need to, you know, close all this by the end of the quarter or the month or whatever. And there was all this pressure. A lot of it was put on myself, but a lot of it was sales managers that I worked for kind of making sure I hit those numbers. And what I started to realize as I got older and I started to coach and run sales organizations of my own is, a lot of times what was happening at that end of the month and the quarter and the year was this kind of, I'd almost call it like artificial pressure, like artificial pressure. And we make bad decisions. We overly discount or we call people and we get too aggressive and all this rapport we've built oftentimes erodes away because we show up needy or desperate, something like that. And I'm not saying all the time. I mean, a lot of times in the month, it makes sense, but some of the times. And so what I started to do was kind of relax into what are we even playing for? Why? Why are we in sales in the first place? Well, to serve people, to solve a problem. Okay, great. So long-term value is really this mindset of like, let's relax, realize what we're playing for. We're playing for a relationship that can go on for years and years and years. And a lot of us in sales, I think we've probably been, been taken into other people's companies as they've moved around, right? We've had clients for half our life or whatever it might be. And I think it's because we change the way we show up to those people and going, you know what? I'm in it for the long haul. I'm in it for the relationship and solving this problem and the next problem and the next, not just for this transaction. So I think when, when as a human being, as a salesperson, we go, wait a minute, let's relax. What are we really doing here? Are we after this transaction? Or are we after years of service and lifetime value? And I think when that happens, a lot of good stuff occurs. We just kind of change our mindset. You know, it makes total sense what you're saying, because I, I think back my early days in the life insurance business many years ago before I started network marketing, got in the life insurance business when I had a burp in my first network marketing business, came back to network marketing, obviously, eventually. But nonetheless, I remember the company I was with, MetLife, you know, one of the, the big boys, they always had a concept, right? grow to a hundred customers you give good service to and those hundred will bring you to 500 and ultimately more. And that, that's exactly what you're saying. Love, love your thoughts on something like that. How you grow with your customer 
you yeah. know, as their families grow, as their businesses grow, et cetera. Absolutely. So in that book, the first mindset is lifetime value in iceberg selling. The second is being of service mindset. And I think that's what we're talking about. Like I, I like to build relationships with my clients and the people I coach, usually they're really into relationship or solution-based selling. They are spending the time to get to know someone. And in that journey, you actually get to know other things about their lives. And that's where this being of service mindset, I think really I almost naturally fits a salesperson. We want to help out people. We want to be of service. And that's just kind of thinking, hey, what else can I do to better this person's life? You know, the value isn't always the thing you're selling. I'll give you a quick story. I had been brought into a company um, the second time, actually, to do some more consulting. The team had grown. It had been a couple of years. Some things over the last couple of years had shifted, as we all know, in their business. And I'm in there and I'm working with them and it's going really well. And they have a new director of marketing. And I'm starting to get to know him a little bit because I'm usually working with sales and marketing teams. And I realize that he's driven, he's smart, but he's kind of young and he's looking for more knowledge. I have this other client that's running this marketing like um, conference workshop. And I was like, you know what? Would you like to go to that? And he goes, yeah, but I don't think we have budget. And I was like, don't worry about that. Would you like to go? Here's the curriculum. This is what we're doing. Yeah, that would be awesome. Call my other friend. Hey, would you be willing to give me a solid? And I'd like to send somebody that's one of my clients there just for free. This is a, you know, help me out. He's like, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that moment wasn't about selling something. That moment was about being a service to a member of the team of that client I was working with. And I think we, as salespeople and human beings, human beings, we probably have like a gazillion stories like that. But if you're selling and you're building relationships, that's another piece here of, of that iceberg. The more you learn, the more you can be a service. And that's one of those places where you start to go from good to great as someone in sales. Yep. Sounds like your neighbor. I think I read his book, Mr. Collins. <laughs> good to also from the Boulder area, Boy, correct? That, that would be a good title of a book. I, I, I met Jim a couple of times, a heck of a guy. Uh, let's talk about the ownership mindset, because I, I, I read a little bit of what you talked about the other night. I love that ownership mindset that people need to develop to yeah. empower them to service their clients better. Thank you. This is one of my probably most favorite mindsets to remind people of. I think all of us want to be accountable. I think oftentimes though, we we wait for things like, oh, well, I need to wait for this thing to happen to me. Or yes, there's this thing I want to do, but an ownership mindset is about removing all excuses. I'm going to own my own success, right? That's so powerful. The only thing that's going to get in my way of my own success is myself. And when, when we start to have this ownership mindset, of being accountable, no excuses, being the person that's just going to make it happen for ourselves, a lot of our world changes. Whether you're you're a sales manager and you can encourage your sales team to do that, or you're a salesperson yourself, just think about that, right? Like, whoa, wait, I got into sales because I wanted to bet on myself already. Well, great. I'm giving you the permission to do what you already wanted to do. Own your own success. And that's one of those things what I, I think sometimes we forget not only as humans, but as people in sales, we just, oh yeah, wait, uh, there's nothing standing in my way. You know, you might hear, oh, this person hasn't called me back. Okay, well, what does that mean? They just haven't called you back. Do you still want to move this forward? Yeah. Do you still have something good to say? Yeah. And that kind of gets into the fourth mindset, which is is almost like the twin brother, which I call driver set mindset, which is don't be a passenger, be a driver, make something happen. Um, you know, the best a passenger can do is, you know, change the change the radio dials, if you will. So be that driver, make some stuff happen for yourself. So those two are kind of tied together of uh, mindsets in the book, Iceberg Sound. Yeah, that, wow, great, great, great stuff, great stuff. Um, how can salespeople transition from being good to great by adopting yeah. these mindsets? Yeah, I think I think it all starts with um, something that I would almost say is before the mindset. Like, what are you playing for? Like, I think in sales, a lot of times we forget why we even took the job or decided to work for ourselves or whatever it might be, we, we forget, right? And it was probably for freedom and independence and supporting our family or a better way of life or what it, fill in the blank. So I think a big part of going from good to great as a salesperson, number one is, hey, reconnect with your why. Why are you doing this? I call it, what are you playing for? What are you playing for? So that when you do have these tough days and we're going to have tough days, no matter what we do for a living, but in sales, it's probably a little bit more obvious. <laughs> you know, we put ourselves out there every single day. So for me, you know, how how does a salesperson start to go from good to great? It's really about um, realizing, getting clear on 
what we're about, what we play for, why we're doing this. And then at minimum, pick some of these mindsets that feel good to you. You know, you might realize, oh my gosh, would I be able to change, you know, close more, be more effective if I just relaxed a little bit, didn't worry about being the end of the month. And I looked at the long-term value and I looked at this as somebody that I want to work with for a long time versus just right now. Um, and then also, like we talked about, just being a service, owning your own actions, owning your own success, and then, you know, getting to, into that drivership mindset, making sure you're the person making things happen, waiting instead of waiting them, waiting for things to happen to you, right? Make it happen for yourself and others. Those were the, those would be the, the four things that I would say, you pick one or two, your life's going to change. You know, I know you've done actual case studies with some of the people that you've worked with, with iceberg selling. So let's talk about some of those success stories. Yeah. So one of my favorite stories is about a, a young guy I was uh, coaching and he's selling professional services and he's doing pretty well, you know, like he's making his numbers more or less most of the time, but there's still a lot of pressure he's carrying. Um, a lot of it's on himself. And and sometimes I would go to him. I was like, Hey, you know, can you be a service? And he's like, what do you mean? You know, what does me being a service mean? I, I call people, I'm telling them I can help them when they're ready, you know? Um, and, and what does ownership mean? Like, I, I, I guess I feel like I don't really know what that means. So we started to kind of break some of this down and it first started with, Hey, what's important to you? Why are you doing this? He goes, well, I, I grew up kind of in relatively poor family. Um, I've been fortunate enough. I went into the military, um, kind of impacted the world in that way, learned a lot of stuff, came out of it. And I started working and, um, I met a woman and I want to get married, but I want to move out of from renting this house to buying a house and raising a family. That's what's important to me. I was like, okay, so how often do you think about that? He's like, you know, pretty often. I was like, but how often do you think about that from kind of turning that into your own ownership? Like, what can you do every day to get closer to your goal? And that was kind of like the first time I think he'd actually done the, done the math and put the dots together. It's like, you're in an opportunity in a job where you can make almost whatever you want. It's uncapped. So let's start talking about how you can show up differently. And what's funny is if I asked him, hey, if you could meet your ideal person and, and have the ideal conversation that you'd sell to, what would it be? And he went right to the bottom of the funnel. We would do this. This is how we solve it. This is what it would cost. This is why we're so great. And I was like, time out, right? That's awesome if they're ready to buy. But most of the people you run into, that's not going to be where they're starting. Their starting point is not the end, right? So let's talk about what being of service is. Let's talk about this iceberg concept. Let's talk about learning more about them and relaxing into this experience of just two human beings getting to know each other. And then on top of that, I want you to realize that you are the person that can move this forward. You don't need to wait for me or one of your managers to tell you to go do something. This is not the military anymore. Right? You don't <laughs> need to wait for your commanding officer to tell you to go do this thing. And I think once he started to just change his his vision or as you know, is uh, what he's looking at, right? Like he just made a sh slight shift of his reality. Different things started to change. And sure enough, you know, his numbers started to pick up. When I looked at the KPIs of activity, they went up. The number of appointments went up because he was just showing up with more service, more value and not rushing things. And he actually felt better too, right? Like he didn't feel like he had to close and he was in this transactional business. He was like, I'm starting to build really great relationships with people. You know, and ultimately he got engaged the last time I interacted with him and he's on the road to what he wants. But most of us already have it. It's just, how do you do a slight shift? Get a mentor, get a guide, get a couple of ideas, maybe meet with somebody on your team and support each other to just look at things a little bit different. So yeah, I mean, I've got a gazillion stories of people that just with some slight changes, they change their life. Well, let's talk about the, like some of the current trends, for example, both in you know the sales process and also in the customer experience process and how iceberg selling is helping both. Yeah, I tell you what, I'll share a little bit here. And then I would love if you want to play along and share some of the things that you've learned too. I, I think I think on a really kind of super high level, um, one people are fatigued with getting sold to. Nobody wants to get manipulated, right? Or persuaded. And, and I mean that not in a positive way, but like a forceful way. Nobody wants to get convinced to do something they don't want to do. And at the same time, there's all this information out there. So it's, it's relatively easy for someone to discover some knowledge about what you might be selling. 
But I think the big gap, and and I and I think AI will never solve this, by the way, if you ever want to kind of have that conversation, is there's a human element of just understanding and slowing down and looking at a transaction, not as a transaction, but as an interaction between people or a couple people or groups of people based on learning and solving. And so in the whole iceberg part of it, I think the more you can approach and we can talk about like the best practices of, of iceberg selling if we want to, but I think it's a, a little bit about how you just start to approach things differently. Being curious, having earlier conversations, being a service, being a guide. Um, people still need guides. I mean, we all, there's so much in our lives and so much data at us. So if somebody can quiet that noise and guide us forward and we start to trust them, then, um, then we're probably going to want to work with that person. So that's kind of what I'm seeing from trends is just like, almost like old is new again, like getting back to just that conversation, that handshake, getting to know people, spending the time, putting in the time instead of just rushing to the next thing and conversations based on short threads on your phone, like uh, putting in a little bit more effort is what I'm seeing. Would you agree that uh, people buy from people and they rebuy from the people that they actually have a relationship with versus what was that guy's name? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, one of the things I like to tell a sales manager or tell a salesperson if I'm coaching them, is I might say, hey, tell me about your funnel, right? We all have funnels. And who's, on, who's on your bottom of the funnel? Who's your next step that you're going to close? And they'll start to tell me the usual answer. Yeah, I think there's an 80% chance and they're talking about budget and this is my next step. And it's all like nuts and bolts, the good things, right? But I'll go, hey, tell me about their world. Can you tell me about their world? And sometimes people pause and they're like, what are you even talking about? And other people are like, oh yeah, you know, John this and this, and this is what he's doing. And this is how his kids are. And this is the challenge and da, 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 da. And he knows their world. I think people buy from people that know their world. You know, I worked, I'd love your response to this, Carl. I worked with a guy who was a trade show guru. I would call him. He was that good up in Saskatchewan, way up, way up North in Canada. Yeah. Years ago, this is, this is way back. But the guy was really, really good at working trade shows. He wasn't really good in my business, but he was really good at selling not only our product, but he had other products that he and his wife actually had from like local vendors. They, 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 and, and he taught me something one day that I think has been lost with all of this technology. And I love your thoughts on this. Uh, what he would do. So let's say he had a conversation like we're having right here. And he said, like, you know, you, you and I earlier with the camera off, right, we compared our kids. And maybe we'll do that at the end. We'll talk about some things with, with, with our kids because we're about the same age, right? So, you know, I know you got an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old. You got, you know, I got a 19-year-old and an 18-year-old. Year and I didn't mm -hmm. mention my 28-year-old. In yeah. California, she's in California. I don't forget her. I just, you know, sometimes it's like, yeah, she's been out there for two years. But, but you know, he, he, anyway, he taught me a valuable thing. And I'd love to how we would do this today. Okay. Because this was in the day of business cards. Remember those things, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so many other people go, what are those, right? Uh, you know, you're not going to text me your information. And anyway, he taught me this. He'd have a fishbowl because every hour he'd give away something free. So what was he doing was he was lead generating. And if you put your business card in his fishbowl, every hour he'd give away, you know, whatever. And, but if he had a conversation like we're having and he'd say, oh, you know, John has three kids, you know, 28, you know, 19, 18, right? They're, you know, ages. And then all of a sudden he called me back three days later and he said, hey, John, man, how, how are those three kids doing today? Mm -hmm. Well, right away, you, you know, your chest went out as on the other end of the phone and you said, hey, you know what? This guy actually remembers talking to me. Well, he talked to, he talked to 600 people that week and he had no idea what I even looked like. But I thought that was such clever salesmanship because it's back personal where that person said this guy actually remembers talking to me how do we do that today when nobody has a business card everything is by you know cell phone cell phone cell phone how do we do that love your thoughts yeah well i i still carry business cards and i will tell you this i made sure they weren't coded so that if you did write on it with a pen it would stick so there's kind of some old schoolness in there but the reason i like business cards is uh, I can put them, I, I know this is like a really old school, there's a, you know, a drawer next to me with a rubber band around it, and I can flip through it, you know, and the problem with today without business cards is, I don't remember your name, I don't remember your company, even if we connect on LinkedIn, how am I going to find you, you know, like, it's it's a sorting, so just for the sake of just kind of me sharing something personally, which gets to my second answer to this question, so much about iceberg selling, when we started, I said, you're an iceberg, I'm an iceberg. So as a salesperson, the more of your iceberg that you can reveal 
enables that other person to reveal some too. We talk about vulnerability, for example. But the other part of sales is, right, if I ask you a question, you're probably going to ask me the same question back. Where are you from? How many kids do you have? You going anywhere? You're going to go, hey, are you going anywhere? You know, how'd you start this job? How'd you get started? Right? So I think it's kind of a yes and here. Yes, um, you got to really spend the time to learn about people, build rapport, understand, truly listen and document it, write it on a business card, put it in your phone, whatever it might be. But also know that the way you start that is by sharing first. And my guess is that guy at the trade show was good at getting people to open up quickly. And then he would meet them where they were and reflect back. And before you know it, they're like, God, this guy gets me. And we love, we all love to be understood. Right. And so I think when he was calling people back, he was like, Hey, remember, I understood you. I got you. And I still do. And that just puts us in a different headspace. We're not defensive. No one feels like we're going to get taken advantage of because this other person revealed to you something about them. In my case, I'm 51 years old. And I just told you, I still carry a business card. <laughs> you know? and there's people that are going to be like, he's kind of a dinosaur. But you know what? <laughs> um, that's okay. If you want to see me as a dinosaur, that's okay. Right. I'm going to share who I am in hopes that you share who you are. Cause I'm genuinely curious about learning and well, understanding. Let's, let's, let's role play a little bit. Let's, let's, let's share sure. some, some, some of your you know strategies and I'll be the would be customer. Putting me on the spot. Sure. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. What do you want to be selling? What, what are you looking for today? Oh, man. What, what well, do you want to? Let's say, uh, well, look, look, most of my listeners are network marketing. So Great. most of them sells variety of pills, powders, and potions. Our show's generic. We've got 15, 16,000 people that listen to it on a irregular basis. Some a lot, some weeks, some not. You know, you know how that is. And it goes to YouTube and all these other things. So we we never really know how many, but you know, most of them are network marketing. Some are full time, some are part. Mo most are part time. Mo most do this, you know, in this economy, obviously yeah. to, you know, to make up the difference. So let's just say that that you're trying to sell me a nutritional product that. Um, well, I use my own business. Okay, you're trying to sell me a nutritional product for the immune system, right? So the first thing, you know, just to kind of frame it up is I really believe that if I'm the salesperson and I'm selling a product, I have to believe in it. So hopefully this is something as a salesperson I've, I've experienced and I know and firsthand um, I'm a believer and, I, and I'm full on because that allows me to have confidence, but also relatability. So I'm just going to kind of add that to, to this role play. So I might say something like, you know, John, I, I, I really appreciate that you're curious about this product. Um, and if it's all right, I'd like to share a little bit about my experience with it and then see if you're willing to share some of yours. And then from there, let's see where the conversation goes. And, you know, who knows, maybe we'll find we have stuff in common. I'll kind of brainstorm a little bit of how this might be a fit for you. And guess what? If it's not, it's totally great. I just appreciate getting to know you. But at the end of the call, if it makes sense, let's, if you need more information or you want to try something or a sample, let's, let's get into that conversation then. But for now, let me just share a little bit about, you know, why I'm doing this. And I might've said something like, you know, over the years as I've gotten older, um, you know, I was with my parents and taking care of my parents. And there were certain things that they had challenges with. And a good friend of mine said, Hey, have you ever had them try X, Y, Z? I said, I don't know how did it work for you. And sure enough, I was with my dad one day, we were playing golf and he kind of brought it up and I said, dad, are you open to trying something? I tried this myself. And it really started to change my life. What do you think? And he said, yeah. And as soon as that happened, I knew I wanted to help other people. So, you know, John, as you've been kind of going about your life and, you know, getting older and you've got friends and parents and stuff like that, what, what's what been showing up for you? Like, what's your life like? What are you hoping to improve? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I just, you know, I think about like, uh, you know, my overall health, obviously, as I get older and, you know, I'm a senior citizen now, which I hate to admit, but uh, I am. And, you know, I'm always thinking about, you know, how do I, you know, how do I feel better? How do I live longer? I mean, I, in my case, uh, Carl, you know, I got married late and had my kids late, you know, a lot of, a lot of my friends, they got the grandkids doing stuff or even the great grandkids in some cases. And, you know, mine are still, you know, kind of around and, and, you know, they're, they're kind of in between, you know, but uh, yeah, I, I like, I want to live long enough to, you know, see my grandson or granddaughter, graduate high school so I, I and i know with you know all the stuff that's happened the last few years with you know pandemics and covids and you know all these other things that you know the longer that i stay stay alive i i you know i'm looking for something to improve my longevity yeah uh, you know true story i had my son turned 18 yesterday 
And that was one of those milestones where I reflected back to, you know, my parents are in their eighties. They come out and visit and I have a pretty active family. My son loves to fly fish. And so I want to bring my dad. And I think about, you know, um, what am I going to be like when I'm older and I have my grandkids too? So are you active now? Like, do you, do you spend a lot of time with your kids? What's that like for you? Yeah, well, I do. Uh, my, my son and I, we train together a couple days a week in the gym. You know, we, awesome. we go there at the same time. We don't talk to each other. He stays on one side, I stay on the other. But, um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we do our thing together there. And uh, my daughter, my younger daughter, uh, she, you know, she lives at home. So, you know, we spend some time together and she's a big reader. So we compare notes on some of the, the classics. You know, she loves the classics and I, you know, Dickens and you know, authors like that, you know, some of the old time authors. So we talk about stuff like that. So we've got some commonality. I got more in common with my son. He's a guy than I do with my daughter, but we have some of that. Of course, my other daughter, she's out in California and we, we text more than anything else yep. because of the time so difference much. and all that, you know, but at least we stay in, in, in contact, but yeah, sure. I'm, I'm active in their lives. Certainly. That's still a connection. I love that. So, you know, I get that too, being able to like exercise in every little moment, every little moment counts. You know, I might be busy and my kids are like, Hey dad, can you fill in the blank? Watch a ski movie with me. Hey dad, will you go fish with me this morning? Do you have any appointments? And every time I can, I say yes. Cause I want that moment. Right. So what have you done or what, I mean, you're working out, what have you been doing? What do you plan to keep doing to make sure you're healthy and around and able to, to have those experiences as, as we move forward in our, in our lives? Well, believe it or not, I, I I stretch twice a day on a yoga mat. I do I do some yoga oh. and, and uh, still lift weights because uh, obviously you know, strength training, resistance training as you get older is important. Uh, so I do a lot of that. And uh, believe it or not, I've even started to throw the shot putting discus again uh, in my old age. I did, oh. that, I did that for a while when the kids were young. And then I stopped when their sports careers were taken off. And now that they're, you know, the, the, they're not tying me up on weekends. I'm doing the occasional track meet. I've got a friend that lives not too far from me and he's great. He was a big 10 champion and Olympic alternate in the discus years ago. And we go out and throw together on a nice day and uh, just enjoy it. You know, I mean, sometimes we saw, I, I, I kid him all the time ago. This is like our barber shop. You know, we solve more of the problems of the world politically and every yeah. other, <laughs> you know, we, we might get 20 throws in each, but you know, we, we solve all the world's problems, of course, you know, but uh, yeah. So I do stuff like that. I try to walk with the wife a couple of times a week, you know, even you, just are... walk dogs, you know, just keep back, keep moving, keep, keep the body. I'm a big fan of the blue zones you know okay. and, and you know the blue zones people they're not out running marathons they're just half the time they're working in the garden or they're doing whatever they do you know regionally where they live in the world so uh kind of adopted some of those principles as i got older is not to kill myself necessarily but to just move the body every day and keep the blood flowing do does your friend that you do the disc with or your son or your wife all the people you talk is there anything they're taking as like a supplement to help them? And have they seen any benefit from that? Or have you explored that at all? Because I mean, ultimately, that might be something where XYZ could help. And I don't know if that's something that you're open to trying or even thinking about, but where are you right now with things like that? I just, 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 you know, I'm answering this not as John Soller, by the way. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> when you Google my background, you'll see I've been with my company 26 years. But no, I know that. I, I'm just, <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just kind of looking at, at you know, what's out there, supplement wise, food wise, you know, because food obviously is important. And you know, what can I take? And you know, what's got some evidence to it? You know, what's something I can take that actually, you know, the medical community would say, okay, you made a good decision. Because you know, the, the reality, Carl, is too, as we both know, none of this stuff's cheap. <laughs> you know, so. You know, you got to spend money on it, but unfortunately, good health, I find, you know, generally costs money. Yeah. You know, at this point, I would probably start to ask you questions like, well, what's more important, you know, science, testimonials? Are you looking for somebody? You know, I've got a lot of stories and a lot of customers that, you know, have a similar profile. Would you ever want to talk to one of them? Uh, you know, you mentioned the science. Have you, you know, is that something you're curious in? I'm happy to share something that with you. And, and I probably also just say, you know, are you open to trying something for a short period of time and seeing how your life is now versus later and just kind of taking, taking that trial to see if it's something that might be the right fit for you. And then depending where that conversation went, I would try to move it toward getting you what you're kind of starting to want. So that kind of becomes that co-creation part of, you know, well, what do you think of? I'm just brainstorming here. Would you like to, you do the discus? There's a friend of mine that is a tracking coach field at, you know, SMU. 
And, you know, he's been doing this, taking these supplements for the last five years. Why don't we head over there and chat with him one day? Like, I'm going to start throwing out ideas based on what you told me that might be a fit. Love it. I love it. And what I, what I love too, just in our conversation, it was a gentle conversation. You didn't try to sell me anything, but you started closing around a third or fourth. Say, hey, how about trying it? Because like anything, be it a supplement, be it an automobile, be it anything, right? And like, eventually it's like, well, look, you know, yeah. try it, try it. If you don't like it, give it back. I'll give you money back, right? <laughs> I think that's, that's where the mind shift of being a guide really shows up. Like if I'm a guide, then I'm helping guide you to the reality that you want. But until I understand that reality, back to that iceberg, you know, I'm just going to be gambling, right? <laughs> like, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, you know, and, and after I do that two or three times, if I didn't know you yet, you're going to start to shut down. This guy doesn't get me. This guy's a clown, right? So it's, it's really one of those things that if you truly believe in what you're selling and you truly want to help that other person, you know, sometimes I even say that like, Hey, I, I really, I do this because I love the impact and helping people change, change people's lives. Are you willing to let me just ask you a couple of questions so that I might be able to help you out of the gate? Would that be okay? And I, I don't think I've ever had somebody say, no, that wouldn't be okay. You know? That's why we're here. We're here to kind of talk. And if I can create value for you, maybe buy two minutes, buy me five, then 10, then 20, before you know it, we're we're getting into solution together. And then you're asking me for the trial and I'm not having to pitch you. You're like, you already know that this is something you want to try. Great, great stuff. And and what that does too, you know, what, what you're doing is you're doing, building a relationship. Absolutely. Now, when, when Carl calls me and says, hey, John, you know what? How are you liking your XYZ product, yeah. right? It's not some stranger salesman calling me. It's, hey, it's my buddy, Carl. Hey, how are you, how are you Carl? Hey, fly, hey, did you fly fish this weekend? Would catch, exactly. right? Exactly. You know? and, and if we can get a clear next step that we agree to together, then when I call you back, I'm not bothering you. I don't have that head trash of like, oh, what am I going to say? Or, you know, hey, are you ready yet? Did you get my proposal? Did you like it? Like, I'm not, I don't have to do that. We already agreed we're going to reconnect. So I might've ended that call like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I tell you what, I'll, I'll mail you some samples. And, you know, it's a three week trial. So why don't I give you a call about a week and a half out? Can we look at our calendars right now? And I'm just going to check in with you and see how it's going. And you're like, yeah, that would be great. Now I don't have to be like, I wonder what John's thinking. I know in a week and a half, he's going to tell me what he's thinking. Now, would that, apply, would that apply on the other, like, like okay, we're talking like, you know, the supplement, for example, we're talking, you know, not a, not a huge purchase, right? you know, hundred, hundred bucks, let's say, right. Would that apply for some of the people that are listening, perhaps that are selling automobiles or more, you know, homes, you know, we have people that obviously, you know, they do network marketing part-time, they sell something else full-time. How is there a difference in building those relationships? You know, this is the craziest thing. And I think if you would have asked me this 20 years ago, you know, Carl, if you were sitting across the, uh, the table of the CEO of a fortune 500 company, would you ask them for a next step? I might've been like, I don't, I don't know, man. You know, like they're the CEO of this big company. Why well, I got to tell you a story. I was sitting across the table from a CEO of a fortune 500 company that I had cold called, pitched an idea to. She happened to come to Denver. We had a beautiful lunch, went and visited her store in the mall. And um, she's a busy lady. So I said, hey, I know you're a busy lady. It seems like we've had a really great meeting. Um, would it be all right if I reached out to your assistant, we scheduled some time so I can check back in after you've thought about this? She's like, yes, please do that. And my, my lesson there is the, the, the more bigger the thing you're selling, the bigger the decision it is, um, maybe even the person you're selling to, they, you see them as a pedestal, right? You, we, I think we all kind of go, oh, I better not change, you know, screw up this relationship by asking for a next step. I am telling you, Anybody that's in leadership and busy, busy people, they want someone to step up and help them out, get on their calendar, make it easy for them because they don't want to be ghost. They don't want to ghost you. They, they want to, they want to move it forward. But if you can't help them move it forward with an appointment, yeah, it can start to move sideways. So I would say no matter what you're helping that other person because ultimately they wanted this thing that they want you to solve their problem. And it's just another step in solving it. Great. Great. So let's come back to iceberg yeah let's ask a couple of other questions right there's an iceberg study. so what are some of the common challenges that salespeople face today and how does iceberg selling address them yeah i think one is we typically think it everything is a transaction like for those of you that do a lot of marketing you might have heard marketing 
qualified lead and MQL or sales qualified lead SQL. And I think a lot of times as salespeople, when we're getting leads, if, if somebody's providing them to us, we think they're ready to buy. And as marketers, you know, we want to give people that are qualified. So there's this gap, number one, there's a gap of like, where is somebody really in their world of buying? And I would say our job as a salesperson is to understand where they are on that journey, not just assume. So I think just because of the digital age and so many of us as consumers can kind of self-serve, get some information, fill out a form, schedule a call, the, our counterparts think, oh, well, that means you're ready to place an order. And that might be true, but I have found more times than not, if I can approach those conversations from the beginning with curiosity and understand where somebody is, then back to the example we talked about earlier, when I start to talk to them, I know where they are. I'm not guessing, or I might've said gambling a little earlier in the call. So I would tell you five really quick steps. Um, the first is do the research. You know, if, if, if you can find out something about this other person before you get on the call, you're automatically starting much further down the field. And it doesn't have to be magic. Like I told you earlier, my parents are in the eighties. If I wanted to plan a surprise party for my dad for his 80th birthday, number one, I'm probably not going to make it a surprise party. 80 year old people don't want to be surprised. <laughs> number two, it's not going to be at nighttime. His friends are not going to go if they have to drive at night. Like these are just basic things, right? Mm -hmm. But by thinking about who these people are and doing the research, we can all automatically kind of get a head start. So back to kind of the story about my father you know, I'm going to make sure if we have it at a restaurant, it's not a dark restaurant. There aren't big stairs. He's going to have his friends that are 80 and 90 years old. So doing the research and it's all around us, right? LinkedIn, website, blogs, everything that we can do. Start your call informed. Your competitors probably won't. And it just automatically creates more credibility. The second is setting yourself up for success. Like um, when you have this meeting, kind of like we did in the role play, tell them where you want to take them. Right? People don't like uncertainty. People don't like to buy when there's uncertainty. So tell them what that experience is going to be like in that first call, um, whether you call it a discovery call or whatever you want to do, but at least get them to understand what, what's going to happen. Nobody wants to wait for that aha or that gotcha later. So just be really cool about it. The third is what we did, build rapport. Start to learn more and more about that iceberg. Get curious, ask open-ended questions, share, be vulnerable. So by the time you start to co-create, which... I call testing for success, step number four, I'm probably right. You've probably already kind of told me. We're already in the ballpark, if, so to speak, of having that conversation. And then the fifth step is just making sure we have a next step, like we talked about too. But I think it's slowing down, realizing that if you want to be successful, it's about understanding someone and moving them forward from where they are, seeking to understand and then moving forward from where they are. So let me ask you. Yeah. Improving sales performance in your company. What's been your greatest challenge and your greatest success? How did you get started? Why did you start? I mean, were you working for somebody else? Where you know, where, where did the journey begin? Yeah, I'll start there. Um, I've had a lot of different companies. And um, from about 2000 to 2010, I had a digital agency. So we built apps. We actually built the first uh, mobile app for the Porsche brand. And so we were doing pretty high-end work and we also had a lot of big, large real estate development. So you might know where this is going. We were dealing with big consumer brands and we were dealing with really large real estate developments. And then 2009, 2010 rolls around and um, my whole funnel just freezes. It wasn't a yes or it was no. We know what it was like then, right? Like that was a really hard time with that great recession. So I ended up closing down my business, declaring bankruptcy, decided to reinvent myself. And when I reinvented myself, I was like, okay, what's the problem I want to solve? And I realized a lot of business owners, the only way they could sell or grow their company in their mind was I better clone myself. If I could just clone myself and you see this, right? They, they've hired salespeople and sales managers, it's a revolving door and they just can't ever to kind of have a breakthrough. So I was like, I'm going to help with that. I can help with that. So I started to kind of take systems and processes that I had in my own career to do lead generation to build rapport, to kind of get people to a place where they want to talk to the domain expert. And I started to outsource that. I would come into other companies and build that for them. And I was super naive because I thought all these companies had these foundations and they didn't. Um, the, what I mean by that is I go into a company and I would say, do you, are you clear on your value? Yeah, I'm clear on my value. And I'd say, okay, if I talk to five random people at the company, am I going to get the same answer? And they would pause and be like, no. 
Okay, so we're not clear on our value. I would say, who's the target customer? I don't know. Well, if, you know, I could put the next best customer in a seat next to your first class seat on an airplane to fly across country. Who would it be? I don't know. Anybody with a checkbook? And it's like, wait a minute. These folks don't know their value, how they're different, who they want to sell to. So I developed something called the revenue equation. And that was kind of this moment where I said, oh, wait, I'm solving problems of like foundations. I ran that company for a while. And then all of a sudden I was like, you know what's going on? is I'm taking everyone's risk and I'm taking their domain, their, their expertise out of their company. How is that of service, right? They're outsourcing something that should be a core competency in their company. I was like, okay, time out. We're going to pivot. We're going to start improving sales performance and we're going to go into companies and help them have strong cultures, help them have clear foundations, bring out the best in their teams and individuals. And that was the aha moment for me. Where, but I had to go on this journey of like in the trenches, figuring it out, getting beaten up some days, winning some days. Um, so I guess I would say to answer your second part, my biggest win was when I made that pivot, I started coming in these companies. Um, I would get emails and texts and letters and postcards and thank you for changing my life. Thank you for believing in me. I told you that story about that Marine earlier. Like he's, he still sends me messages and he'll take a snapshot of, of, of he's out fishing. And he's like, you know, I just closed some more deals. I'm out fishing with my friends. Like, and I haven't worked with him for a year. So for me, the win was, man, I started to impact people's lives. And I realized that's what I wanted to play for. Where the other company I get messages like, why haven't you gotten us enough leads? I was like, wait a minute. Right. <laughs> so I think the big win was, helping people change and grow and find that they have the strengths within them and helping them bring that forward. Cause that's ultimately more scalable and more satisfying than a check in my opinion, for me, at least. So for someone may, <clears throat> maybe new to the selling profession yeah. and maybe, and maybe they're struggling a little bit or, you know, somebody that's been around a while and they're just struggling because they're struggling. They forgot what got them successful in the first place. Right. Which, you know, I sometimes go through, I sometimes forget how I got here. Do. Right? Yeah, I think we all do. Yeah, we all do. It's you know, human nature, right? So how, what advice would you give those people to kind of reboot to get back where they need to be or yeah. want to be or or more importantly, exceed where they were? Yeah, uh, kind of like we talked about earlier. You know, first, I would say, if you kind of like the idea of iceberg selling, um, skim it, read it, you know, listen to this podcast again, get some pointers. But I think the most important thing is you got to get clear on why you're in the game and what you're playing for. Um, and you might've found that it's not the right fit for you. And the sooner you know that, great, go do something else. But if you're like, no, I want to bet on myself. This is what I'm doing. Then really own that. And then I think the second one is realizing that money is a byproduct of doing a great job. I think a lot of times in sales, you see the movies, right? All these crazy sales movies, they're entertaining as can be, right? But they're not real reality in my opinion, right? It's not, how do I you know, get them to sign on the line that is dotted, right? It's not, it's not this, <laughs> this big thing like that. It's like, man, who did I help today? And the more I help people, um, it's, it's kind of like you said, when you were at your other job, they refer, they tell other people, you, you start to get a reputation of impact and positive impact. And I think ultimately, if you're in sales, that's, that's what I would want to play for. Like, how do I keep raising my game? How do I keep learning? How do I keep showing up in a way where I do get that thank you text? Hey, thank you you know, these supplements are great. You changed my life. Right? How do I get that? And I'm playing for those moments versus an extra five or 10 or a hundred grand in my check checking account at the end of the month or end of the year, right? Like that's the byproduct of being of service and just really bringing all this forward. Great, great. So as, as we get to start wrapping up here, Paul, yeah. believe it or not, we pre-record these. I should have told you this earlier. So you are going to be, because when I read your bio, I was like, I want this to be the, the launch 2024. You're going to be the first interview of 2024. Awesome. And, and so the people, when they actually are listening to this, are just going to come out of Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's, Kwanzaa, yeah. whatever they celebrate or don't celebrate. Okay. Let's talk about 2024 for a minute. How do they be the best version of themselves in 2024? What would your couple of key strategy points be for them? activities, yeah. et cetera. My first one is if you can see everything as an iceberg, and I even mean your family, your teenage son, your teenage daughter, your grandparents, your parents, your spouse, you're going to change your life. Like how many of you have had this experience? You come home, your partner opens the dishwasher, you loaded it wrong or something like that, your version of that. 
it's probably not that you loaded it wrong. Stick with me here. There's probably something else below the surface. If you can start to approach everything in 2024 as what's really going on and get curious, you're going to start to change the dynamics in your personal life and your professional life. This applies to your manager or if you're managing people, your best customers, if they keep buying from you, get curious. And when you do, you're going to change how you're showing up in those situations. You're going to learn more. And as you learn more, there's a lot more possibilities of what you can do to move things forward, how you show up to people. So my first one would be like, just take a moment to do that. The second one is I'm going to get back to that ownership and drivership mindset. This is about empowerment. It's January 1. You're listening to this. Empower yourself. Be accountable for your own success and don't let anything get in the way. Get in that driver's seat of your own life and drive. And if you have excuses, well, I can't. There's a this, there's a that. I, I Sometimes I have to be a passenger. I'm just going to invite you to play around for the month of January. Do it differently. Drive it a little. Stay a little extra. Make that extra phone call. Go to that extra meeting. Ask for that extra referral. Ask for a mentor. Do something that's for you. And I think when you start to do that and you combine that with looking at everything as an iceberg, 2024 will change for you in a really good way. Well, here's the most important question. They should use iceberg selling as part of their learning because we're always learning. Even at 62, we're still learning, Absolutely. right? And and uh, I, I work with a guy who's 80 up in Canada. And he's still learning. Where do they get iceberg selling and, and your other books and products? And where do they reach out to you? Yeah, the simplest thing, remember iceberg selling, go to icebergselling.com. I have a website completely dedicated to that book. There's lessons, there's videos, there's just, even if you just go there, you don't even buy the book. You're going to get inspired. You're going to learn something. If you're inclined, buy the book. That would be awesome. There's also links there to my company site, which is called improvingsalesperformance.com. All three books are there. Um, you can download sam sample chapters. You can listen to sample chapters if you like to learn by listening. And if you're just curious to follow me, sign up for a blog, send me a LinkedIn. There's all my contact information is all over that. It'll probably be in the show notes, but reach out if you have a question. I respond to everybody. Um, that's just kind of who I am, what I'm about. But yeah, check out icebergselling.com. Start there. It's a fast, easy, fun read. Tons of stories. I think you're going to love it. Okay. So we got a couple of minutes left. Let's have a little fun. Okay. You got baseballs behind you. I know the story because I asked you earlier, yeah. but I know some of our people are wondering, okay, what's the stories with the baseball? Yeah. So um, here we go. It's about 10 years ago. And uh, my kid, my youngest kid was seven. I mean, my, my oldest kid was seven. My youngest is five. My wife and I never had any time together. A good friend of mine calls and goes, hey, man, I have two tickets to the Colorado Rockies. They're great seats. Do you want them? This was like a week before the game. I was like, absolutely. We do everything we can to get a sitter. Nothing, right? It's a late game on a Saturday. Mm. And uh, I finally go, hey, I, we're taking Sam. We're taking my seven-year-old. That's what we're doing. As soon as I tell Sam, he's th through the moon. Like, he's excited. He grabs his mitt, this little mitt, right? He's seven. We're going to catch the ball. We're going to catch the ball. We're going to catch the ball. And for some reason, as a dad, and I don't know why I did this, I said, yes, we are. So um, we get in the car, we drive to the game, and we're there a little bit early because I just wanted him to have experience. This might have been the second time of him at a ball game. And he keeps leaning over me, pretending he's going to catch the ball. We're dad, we're going to catch one, right? I'm like, yeah, I'm just like buying my own hype, right? So sure enough, it's the third inning. Uh, Michael Kadir is up to bat. And I kept going through my mind, if this ball really comes to me, how do I make sure I don't knock him over and I'm on Sports Center as that dad that everyone's laughing at? <laughs> I'm going to be calm. I'm going to stand up and put my arm out. The ball is going to land. I'm going to grab it. I'm going to pause for a minute so I don't drop it. I'm going to turn to my son. I'm going to give him this ball. That's what I'm going to do. So sure enough, my son's like, when are we going to catch a ball? Like I said, Michael Kadir's up. He hits this foul ball right to me. Like, I, I'm 100% serious. There's no joking here. This is all real. I stand up, I catch the ball, I do everything that was in my head, head, and I had imagined I give it to my son. He looks at me, smiling, he goes, Dad, when are we gonna get the next one? Right. And I was like, oh my God. Well, I've told you I have two sons. So I started to go, how would I want to get another ball? How would I get another ball? We have five now, just to kind of spoil the story. So I'm going to speak at a conference in Dallas, actually. And there, we go and see the Cowboys Stadium because I, even though I live in Colorado, my youngest is a Cowboys fan. I know. Don't hold it against me if you live in Colorado and listen to this. So we go down, we see uh, the Cowboys Stadium, then we go see a Rangers game. Well, I started to go, how would I hack this? So we're all dressed in Ranger gear, all four of us. 
we get some seats right in back of third base. And, uh, you know, I just kind of keep thinking, I'm going to get this ball. I'm going to get this ball. I'm going to get this ball. It's the ninth inning. I still don't have a ball. My family is looking at me like, uh huh. And I was like, no, I have the faith. This is going to happen. Sure enough, they're playing the Mariners, pop fly, hits kind of some bricks, pops back out. Beltre, who's your third baseman, I believe, grabs it, looks up, sees me and my son, tosses it to me. We both grab it. That was ball number two. So the whole idea with the baseball, and I cover this in my first book, Set Up to Win, is chance favors the prepared. Sales isn't about one waterfall event. It's about a lot of little things, right? I had, was dressed like the home team. I had kids. I was in back of third base, right? I had a positive mindset and it happened and it's happened five times. So to me, that's why I have the baseballs there a reminder that sales isn't just one magic thing. It's a lot of little things that all come together if you want to win. Wow. That, that, awesome. Awesome story. Thank you. Bel Beltran will probably be a Hall of Famer. He's going to be retired five years, I think. I think he's retired two or three already. So uh, yeah, he was a heck of a player, but I, I lo love the story and the optimism, you know, because last thing you want to do is lie to your kids when they're five or seven. When they get to 18 or 19, you know, they kind of figure out, hey, there's 70,000 people here. We may not get a ball, right? But yeah, yeah, I love it. Love it. Great, great story. Well, this this has been a privilege, Carl. And, and uh, I'll give you the last word. Anything else you want to share with our listeners? You know, I'm going to, I'm going to say this, everyone out there that's selling, I wish you the best. And I really want you to believe in yourself. You make a difference. You make a difference in the life of the companies you work for and the, even the people, right? You're, you're closing deals. You're helping people make payroll. You're making a difference in your life. So I would say if you have some self-doubt, you know, get clear on what you're playing for and, and know that you're an important, important person and you can do this. So I'm all in, I'm all in with the salesperson. So believe in yourself, make it happen. That's what I'm going to leave with. Great. Well, thanks so much. Hang one second. We'll do a little housekeeping and uh, thank you all for listening. Awesome. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Leave Nothing to Chance. If you want to know more about what it takes to succeed in the network marketing space, join us again next week for another amazing episode. For additional resources and to connect with John Soliter, visit leavingnothingtochance.com. Don't forget to leave a review and we'll see you next time.